really, really proud to introduce our my contact for our relationship with the Van Vleck Observatory at Wesleyan University, also my alma mater and my wife's place of business and alma mater. And that's a prof associate professor of the practice in astronomy. And thank goodness that that's an improvement from the old one, uh, Professor Roy Kilgard. Professor Kilgard literally is an astrophysicist. So he is still practicing in astronomy. That was bad fun. But he comes to us from the Harvard Center, the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Boston. We managed to pull him away from there. Um, I don't know how, but we are really proud to have him here. So with no little further ado, I am actually going to do this, Roy, even though I threatened not to, live directly from the Van Vleck Observatory. I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Roy Kilgard, who is speaking on the history of the Van Vleck Observatory. Roy, take yourself off mute and let me know how you'd like to hand, handle questions at the end as they come through chat or what. Uh, thanks, John. Um, thanks for having me to speak to you guys uh, over Zoom. I'm sorry we can't do this at Van Vleck Observatory, but hopefully we will be able to do that again relatively soon as, as long as things continue to improve in society. Um, and uh, as far as questions go, I'm, I'm happy for people to interrupt me. I probably can't monitor the chat while I'm, uh, while I'm talking, but if, John, if you see anything come up in the chat, feel free to, to interrupt me um, or, and or we can do questions at the end, whatever you guys want to do. <laughs> I um, usually leave that to you, but I'll monitor the chat. I, I'm, I'm used, to, uh, used to lots of Zoom, so I can, I can do this. So. All right, is that working? Good. Okay, so uh, this is my, my rough title, and uh, I uh, this is mostly uh, uh, going to be based in some work that we did a few years ago as part of this project called Under Connecticut Skies. Um, it was work that I did in collaboration with some historians here uh, at Wesleyan, and I especially want to to thank and perhaps apologize to my historian colleagues, Amaris Williams, who's now the director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations, and Paul Erickson, who's a professor at Wesleyan in history and science and society. Um, I also have to begin with a general caveat. I am not a historian. Um, uh, I'm only at best an amateur historian. Uh, and as John said in the introduction, I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, I'm a high energy astrophysicist by training. I use mostly telescopes that are in space for my research, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, um, and I study black hole growth and evolution. And so th these are some images of, of mine. Uh, on the left is, is a Chandra image of the Whirlpool Galaxy, and on the right is that same image composited with Hubble Space Telescope observations. Um, so that you can see how they how they overlap with each other. I'm not going to talk about this at all, but this that's just by way of general caveat that I'm used to thinking about black hole accretion physics in my day job, and history is just sort of a thing that I do on the side for fun. Um, so here, here's kind of a general outline of what I'm going to talk about, and I apologize, my clock vanished from my screen, so I need to. Well, the only clock that I have in my office shows sidereal time, not, not clock time. Uh, so it does me no good in, uh, in keeping track of my pace. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to very briefly talk about what astronomy was like at Wesleyan before the Van Vleck Observatory existed. I don't want to spend a ton of time on that, but I'm happy to answer questions about that time period uh, if you have them. Um, I want to kind of really start with a general question, which is why would you build an observatory at Wesleyan or on a liberal arts college campus in general. Um, and then once the observatory is built, uh, it immediately faced a crisis that it thankfully averted. And we'll talk about that. I want to talk about kind of the major work that was done at the observatory over the 20th century. A little bit about the building and the spaces within it and how those have changed or not over time. Yet another crisis that was averted uh, with the observatory um, and kind of the, the future of the observatory uh, as well, the present and future a little bit. 
And we'll see how much of that I actually get through as we go along. Um, all right. So uh, astronomy began from the at the foundation of the university. Wesleyan was founded in 1831, but it really took a couple of years to get going with, with classes and students. And uh, Wesleyan's first president, President Fisk, uh, uh, arose to the seat of power and did what all good leaders do when they, they get in that position. He promptly took a vacation to Europe for a year. And uh, on his vacation, his primary kind of mission was uh, to purchase scientific equipment for help in establishing this new university. Um, and one of the pieces of equipment that he purchased was a telescope. And it's this one, which is still in the lobby of the observatory, the Fisk telescope, which is a six inch uh, refracting telescope uh, built in, in Paris and outfitted at the Paris Observatory and tested to make sure it was of fine optical quality before being shipped to the United States in 1836 where it was for a little bit less than a year, the largest telescope in the Americas. Uh, then Yale bought a bigger one and it was all downhill from there. But um, uh, I, it's a little unclear how much use the telescope got for the first couple of decades of Wesleyan's life until they finally hired an astronomer um, on the faculty. And the person who they hired was John Monroe Van Vleck for whom the building is named. And he was the professor of astronomy and mathematics. And that was his, his title. They were a unified uh, field at that point in time. Um, and he started using this telescope in earnest. Um, liberal arts colleges like to show off as part of their kind of competition with one another for for a, a very small, uh, but largely very affluent student body. And uh, one of the ways that Wesleyan did this, even before they'd hired an astronomer, was that there was this touring exhibition traveling across the country of this orrery uh, that had been built. Uh, it was about 20 feet across, working model of the solar system um, that could be operated by hand crank and had two modes in which it could be assembled with just the inner solar system uh, or the entire solar system. And you could see the motion of the planets and some of their moons uh, as well. And um, when it came to, to Connecticut on its tour around the country, Wesleyan bought it. It bought the whole thing. It's one of the finest orreries that's ever been, been built in the world. And uh, they bought it and housed it in the and the science center at the time, which then became the, the Natural History Museum on campus um, around the turn of the 20th century. And there's a couple of really cool things you can see in this uh, illustration from, from the 1840s. Um, it, they, they added uh, Neptune to the model after it was discovered. Um, and Uranus and Neptune don't have their proper names yet. Uranus is labeled Herschel and Neptune is labeled Le Verrier uh, after their discoverer. So they haven't been given their proper names yet uh, by, by 1849. And uh, maybe some of you guys remember this uh, from, from 15 years ago or more from visiting the observatory, but there used to be several pieces of this mounted in this one glass display case in the hallway. And there was a little museum placard below that, that said, uh, these are the only pieces that were surviving of this orrery and all the rest of them had been thrown away. And when we started digging around the observatory, one of the first things that we found was this box labeled planets emphatically with a period at the end, which I, I really love this, the stenciling on this box. And you open up the box and there are lots of planets there are stacks of moons, little gears and spindles for holding them up. There are these little wooden dowels that the, uh, that the moving pieces could sit upon. There were hundreds more pieces to this thing that uh, we were told only had a few surviving glass spheres in its collections. Um, so from that moment, I learned never to trust what's on the little museum labels. Uh, <laughs> 
um, unless you write them yourself. And this is just one of those spheres um, held in, in my hand with a, with a glove on. I, I love the detail of this, these hand-painted spheres. There's Mars, again, with the emphatic period on the end, and the surface details. This is for the, when, you, when you're just using the inner solar system model. So it's a little bit smaller than a baseball in size. Um, and so this was the beginning of, of colleges, liberal arts colleges kind of competing with one another and trying to show off on these grand scales was the construction of this large orrery in the Science Center at Wesleyan. So here's John Van Vleck um, with a, a group of students and the back of this photograph is labeled the first course in practical astronomy at Wesleyan it's from the 1870s or so. And uh, I, I very much like this photo for several different reasons. They have all these instruments in their hands. You can tell that at least one of them is a, is a sextant. This guy's holding a sextant. Um, the, the guy with the curly from the Three Stooges hair uh, looks like he's holding a little spectrograph. Um, and there uh, are a couple of clocks here. It's, I think that this is a chronometer that I think we have. I think we have this sextant still also in our collections. Um, but I, I love the, the grass next to this building, which shows the way university landscaping used to be in the, in the 1800s. You would never have anything like this on a college campus now. They're so meticulous. Um, and this was Wesleyan's first real observatory. Uh, it was built on top of a dormitory. Um, and if you're familiar with the campus, this is where the, uh, the Public Affairs Center now is, which is under extensive renovations at the moment on our campus. If you drive by our campus and see horrible construction happening, that's where this building used to be in the 1800s. And they built this turret style dome on the top of the, the dormitory. And it housed uh, a 12 inch refracting telescope, a 12 inch Clark refractor, um, which has its own fascinating history. Um, and if you're super interested in that, I, I just published a paper with Horace Smith, who's a departmental alum in the Journal of the Antique Telescope Society uh, about that telescope and its history at, uh, at Wesleyan. Um, and so I'm not gonna really talk, talk more about it, except to say that our first Clark telescope wasn't the one that's in the big dome. It was this one, which is a 12 inch um, and was used for some years for mostly student observations and not much science. Okay, so here's the Van Vleck Observatory in a, in a more recent photo. This is one from just a few years ago. Um, and um, it, it, so let, let's think about the question of why you would build an observatory on a liberal arts college campus. We all know what the Connecticut weather is like, right? <laughs> You get, if you're very, very lucky, you might get 100 nights a year when you can do observations, but it's probably lower than that. Um, we're uh, on our campus, we're you know, a mile from the Connecticut River. Our, our elevation above sea level is 65 meters. Um, it, it, in the mornings, it's almost always foggy up on top of the hill um, when, when the weather's above freezing. And um, in general, it, it's not a great location for observing, even though at the time of its construction at the turn of the 20th century, Middletown was not, you know, a, a very large town and there wasn't quite the light pollution coming from both Hartford and New Haven that there, there is now. Um, and so why would you do this at all? Why would you invest a large sum of money in building an observatory on a college campus? Well, the answer is that it's for the same reason that they purchased the orrery in the 1830s. Uh, it's to show off. Uh, when the observatory on our campus was built, all of the campus was just a few buildings at the bottom of, of the hill. And the observatory was built at really what is what would have been the edge of Middletown. There was no Middletown westward of where the observatory was. And, and Middletown proper was what's now downtown Middletown and, and stretching to the north and south along the river. Um, this would have been visible from most locations in town and certainly anywhere on campus. So if you build an observatory like this, it is a very visible way of showing that you care about science, even if you don't. Um, it, it's, a, it's a way of showing visually that you do. And 
So it was to, to compete with all of the other liberal arts colleges that were building similar observatories at the same time frame. Uh, and this is especially Amherst College. Um, and uh, you know, they couldn't compete with Yale as much as they wanted to, but, um, but the smaller liberal arts colleges, uh, especially in, along the East Coast. Um, and they all built observatories around this time. Uh, Wesleyan had hired uh, around the same period uh, the architect Henry Bacon, who's perhaps uh, who's a Beaux Arts architect, who's most famous for designing the Lincoln Memorial uh, in Washington D.C., but designed several buildings on our campus, including uh, eclectic the eclectic house and also uh, Olin Library, the university's main library. Um, and he was hired to uh, to design the observatory as part of a master plan for laying out uh, what would be Wesleyan's campus in the, the bulk of the 20th century. Uh, the rest of that plan was never realized, but there are interesting plans that they'd drawn up for building a whole quad of buildings of the observatory right at the edge. Um, and to go along with this, Wesleyan hired an astronomer. Um, the seed money for building the observatory came from the brother of John Van Vleck, Joseph Van Vleck, um, who was a successful businessman. And when his brother died, he, he bequeathed a very large sum of money to Wesleyan to, to build an observatory in his brother's name. And so they had an architect, and they needed an astronomer, and they searched across the whole country uh, and specifically recruited uh, an astronomer named Fred Frederick Slocum to be the observatory's first director. Um, and immediately upon accepting the position, Slocum and Henry Bacon get into an argument, a, a whole drawn out series of arguments, in fact, that lasted for, for a couple of years about how this building would look and, and what its final footprint would be like. Um, uh, Slocum was arguing from the astronomer's practical side of things, which is that you want to make the building out of something that is not going to absorb heat so that it can uh, re-radiate its heat very quickly. Um, and you want the, the primary observing dome to be on the south of the building um, because most of the targets that they planned on observing would be in the southern sky. And that gives you the greatest kind of visibility without building interference uh, in, in the way. Um, he insisted that the building be perfectly north, south, east, west aligned. And, um, and had many other kind of very <laughs> specific thoughts about what it should, should look like as well. Um, some of these arguments Slocum won, but most of them he lost to, to the architect. Uh, the building is built of, of Portland brownstone that was uh, collected, harvested, and collected right across the river, um, which is not the best thermal material to build a building out of. And Henry Bacon's argument was, oh, we'll just plant ivy all over it. The building will be covered with ivy, and that will keep it cool. Um, they had arguments about what the roofs of the different structures would be made of. But the biggest argument about the placement of the dome was won by uh, one by Henry Bacon. It was positioned to the east of the observatory rather than to the south um, because that makes it the most visible to the rest of campus. And, you see, and, and that was the, the reason for the building being arranged the way that it was. So this was the floor plan that was finally decided upon uh, for the building. And we'll come back to, to this in a little bit. Um, but this is basically what it looks like uh, to this day um, with the the big dome at the far east of the building um, and the library and classroom still as they are, uh, uh, still as they were more or less a century ago, minor updates. Um, and those were things that Slocum did insist upon from the very beginning. He wanted the observatory not just to be the space where astronomy was done, but the space where the education of the students was done as well. So the classroom, the research, the data collection um, and the data processing were all to happen in the same physical space. And there's some reasons for, for all of those things that we'll, we'll come back to in a little bit. Um, here's the building under construction. I love this photograph because there are these horses in the background and it's 1914. 
um, and horses are still a practical way of moving kind of mass, large masses around, right? Um, which uh, kind of struck me, I think. This is uh, from the, the north, northeast of the building looking at it. Um, and this really gives you a sense for how this was really the middle of nowhere. It's way on the edge of campus. There was nothing around it at all. There are trees to the south, um, which are mostly all gone now. And this is the main frame of the building has been, has been built and the skeleton of the dome is being constructed. And here's a photograph from the roof of, uh, of, of the mount of the telescope being lowered through the dome. And you can, even though this is a black and white photo, you can tell that they haven't painted the dome white yet. In this case, it still is shiny. Um, the, the, the skeleton of the dome or the, the skin of the dome, I guess I should say, is made of tin. Um, and there it is with the ivy fully covering the building as Henry Bacon designed. Uh, it's quite striking, but not, uh, not the best for long-term uh, maintenance of the building. The ivy very slowly destroys the brownstone. And had it been left there, we might not have an observatory anymore. Um, it did keep it cooler as, as designed, but alas. Um, so here's Frederick Slocum in the observatory. Um, with, with the telescope and this lovely staged photograph. Um, they really used all of the modern conveniences that were available to them at the time of, of construction in the 19 teens and, and building this observatory. You know, most old observatories with large refractors in them have elaborate observers chairs where the chair can move up an arc and then that whole thing can rotate around. Um, and this was one of the first large observatories built with an elevated platform for the floor instead of, uh, instead of an elaborate observers chair. Um, and the thing that really uh, let them get away with this uh, was that Otis Elevator had been building uh, elevators for cars in New York City uh, for a few years by this point, and they knew they could build large stable lift platforms that could lift the mass of a car, and so they could build this this 34 foot uh, stable lift platform uh, to position the observer at the right. Uh, level for the eyepiece, even though it's not in this photograph, which is kind of funny for a staged photograph. It's, I, I don't know why they didn't lower the floor. Perhaps it's to make Slocum look more impressive um, in, in the photograph. Um, so Slocum arrives um, and he's charged with outfitting uh, the observatory and getting it up and running. But this is now 1917, and the, the climate in the world has changed quite a lot from a couple of years before. And it was a very difficult decision for Slocum to decide to come to Wesleyan in the first place. He was, at, prior to coming here, uh, at Yerkes Observatory, which was the biggest telescope in the world at that point uh, in time. And Yerkes has this 40-inch refracting telescope, right? It's the largest refractor built. And so that was the cutting edge place to do astronomy. And Slocum was, uh, was working on the spectrum of the sun. And in 1912, 1913, they do not know what the power source of the sun is yet. The leading theory is that the sun is powered by radioactive decay and that the composition of the sun matches the composition of the earth, which is to say it should mostly be iron. Um, and that was the only thing that they could come up with at that point that could provide enough energy uh, that you could power uh, a sun to stop from collapsing gravitationally. So he was working on this problem of the solar spectrum and why it didn't quite perfectly match the spectrum of the chemistry of the earth and how you could, you could create a star that could support its own weight. And this is a problem that will be solved a, a decade or so later by Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin uh, solving the Saha equations for stars and realizing that they're not supported by radioactive decay, they're supported by nuclear fusion. Um, so that's not known yet at that point in time. And he's working on this problem, which is really the solving of that problem was the birth of modern astrophysics. So um, he's a very sought after astronomer. Uh, lots of places are trying to, to draw him away uh, from Yerkes and he chooses to come to Wesleyan um, where he won't be able to pursue this science anymore. 
uh, and will have to do something very different with his career instead. Um, so then the First World War happens and the US involvement in the First World War starts to, uh, starts to ramp up. And this is a letter from April, 1917, in which Slocum writes to the Secretary of the Navy and says, hey, I'm an astronomer and I'm also uh, an expert on navigation. My dad was a sea captain and I grew up, uh, grew up on the oceans. Uh, so I know about navig practical navigation from sailing and I know about uh, computational navigation because I'm an astronomer. Um, I would like to be of service to the country. What can I do? And they ship him off to Brown University where he spent the war teaching uh, naval cadets navigation. And here's Slocum at Brown. And I love the, 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 the celestial sphere on the chalkboard behind him because uh, since I'm teaching observational astronomy uh, this semester, I have notes where I, that look exactly like that from, from teaching how you do spherical coordinate transformations to undergraduate students. And um, instead he was teaching it to, to cadets um, to, to prepare them for going off to, to war. And uh, Slocum spent a couple of years at Brown in 1917, 1918. Um, and uh, during that period of time, he, you could tell he was starting to regret his decision a little bit to go to come to Wesleyan in the first place. And he uh, started a correspondence with the director of the observatory at Yale and was offered a job at Yale and almost accepted it. And in which case our, our observatory would have had a very different history, but instead he chose to return to Wesleyan as the US involvement in the war was wrapping up. And um, I feel like this is a choice that a lot of academics make at, at some point in their careers where you go from being one of the kind of top people in your field to being the person whose job it is to generate, uh, to educate the next generation of, of scholars. Um, and so I, you know, I think it was, uh, I hope it wasn't bittersweet or too sad for him. I don't know. Um, and he certainly had a very productive career from then on, but it wasn't quite the same. Um, and I think about that a lot. There he is with more, more cadets. <laughs> um, more people. Anyway, so he returns to Wesleyan, um, and now it's time to get an observing project up and running, except he can't quite do it yet. Uh, and he also can't, he can't do it yet for all reasons also related to the First World War. Um, he had ordered uh, lenses from Alvin Clark for the telescope to be 18 and a half inches in, in diameter. And uh, the, the glass lens blanks were delayed because the only place Clark could get them from was from the Schott Glass Company in Germany. And it wasn't until after the war that Schott was able to send glass blanks again to Clark. And they sent them in 1920 and Clark crafted them into, into lenses for the telescope. And they were delivered uh, to Van Vleck in late 1921. And here are two engineers from Alvin Clark uh, with the lenses in their optics package, getting ready to be installed on the end of the telescope in, in 1921. And uh, thankfully, the, the lens blanks that they sent were better than spec, and the lenses that were crafted were 20 inches in diameter instead of 18. Uh, so it's a slightly larger telescope than anticipated. And it's a uh, the lens. It's two two lenses uh, sandwiched together with this air gap in between them, and um, it's two lenses because a single any single lens uh, suffers from chromatic aberration, which you guys probably all know about. But in case you don't, chromatic aberration is means that different colors of light reach focus at different distance from the lens, um, and. So if you want both red and blue to be in focus, you're constantly cranking the telescope in and out. Um, and uh, the, the double lens package is an achromatic doublet. Um, so the second lens is meant to correct as much as it can for chromatic aberration and bring as much of the, the spectrum as you can into focus at the same point. 
from the telescope still doesn't work perfectly. There's no way to make it work perfectly, but it works better than if there'd been a single lens. Um, you can also see inside the pier of the telescope, the, the original pendulum clock drive, um, which I wish had been saved, but was gone long before I got here, tragically. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful looking machine. It looks just like the pendulum clock drives and refractors that still have them. And uh, this is a, a photograph in the, um, in the original publications of the Van Vleck Observatory, where the telescope was labeled the 18 and a half inch telescope. And in Slocum's hand, he scratched it out and written in 20 <laughs> instead of 18 and a half. Um, this was his personal copy of the book that's in our collections now. He was quite happy with the new instrument uh, when it was finally operational. And so he had a telescope, he had an observatory, and he needed a science project. And the science project that Slocum had decided upon was the was parallax, uh, calculating distances to nearby stars through through stellar parallax, through annual parallax, where you take observations on when the Earth is on one side of the sun and take observations when the Earth is on the other side of the sun six months apart, and you can use the angular shift to of, of a nearby star to calculate its distance with trigonometry. And it's such a simple measurement in theory, but it's actually monstrously complicated for a huge number of reasons, right? It's complicated because without having measured distances to the stars, you don't know which are the nearby ones and which are the distant ones that, to compare them against for measuring an angular shift. It's complicated because the Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle around the sun, it's elliptical. and so when you're here versus when you're here six months later on the other side of the sun, uh, the, the distance is different. And so you're not quite measuring exactly the same thing in each case. Um, and it's complicated because if you want to observe stars six months apart from one another, uh, then you're only ever observing shortly after sunset and shortly before sunrise, or else the same star is not visible six months apart unless it's circumpolar. Um, and so it, it's a terribly complicated process uh, observationally, um, but it's even further complicated because, you know, stars are very, very far away. And so parallax angles are really, really small. The largest parallax angle for any star is for the most nearby star to us that's not the sun, which is Alpha Centauri system. And Alpha Centauri's parallax uh, is, is about seven tenths of an arc second on the sky. This, the best seeing that you get from our campus is two and a half arc seconds, maybe. So you're trying to resolve an angular shift that is significantly better than, uh, than seeing will allow you uh, to do in any single observation. Um, so you have to also devise a means for, uh, for calculating the quality of the seeing that you have and taking that into account when you do the error prop propagation in your calculations. And the way that they did it was not the way that we would do those kinds of calculations now, um, but it was really kind of ingenious. Um, and I could talk about it for, for ages, but I'm not gonna. Um, uh, suffice it to say that it worked, um, but from when observation started in the parallax program in, in late 1921, um, the, uh, it was another uh, 12 and a half years before they published the first parallaxes for stars that were measured with the telescope. And the first really good list wasn't until 1935. Um, and they kept refining and refining and refining that catalog with observations over the subsequent decades, all the way until really into the, the early 1990s um, when, when ground-based parallax observations uh, became a thing of the past, um, put largely out of business by the Hipparchos satellite um, that could do it much, much better from space where you don't have to deal with the atmosphere. Um, nonetheless, uh, we, we just recently, um, we compared the, the Van Vleck Observatory catalog of parallaxes with parallaxes from the Gaia satellite, which was launched in 2016, and has now produced uh, a catalog of parallaxes to several billion stars in the Milky Way. And uh, the, the Van Vleck ones are good. They're really good. They're good to at least a couple of decimal places. It's remarkable what they were able to do uh, through, through the parallax program. Um, 
So all the observations that were, were taken with the telescope were taken on, on glass photographic plates, like, like this one uh, in the photograph. Um, and you use glass for, for many reasons. It's thermally stable. It doesn't expand or contract as the temperature changes. Uh, it's geometrically stable. It doesn't flex like film does. Um, and um, it's a very large format um, compared to what you could get away with, with film. Um, and uh, they also were able to do something that you never would have been able to do uh, with film, which is that uh, they took advantage of the fact that stars, bright stars especially, are spaced very sparsely on the sky. And they took many exposures on a single plate. On, on every parallax plate, they actually took six exposures. They would take one, move the telescope, take another and move the telescope and take another. And then they would rotate the plate camera 180 degrees and do it again. And take, so they could squeeze six observations onto a single glass plate. It's a very economical thing to do. Um, and there's no real downside uh, to doing it. So in the markings that are on this plate on the left on the slide, uh, the red ones are from one rotation of the plate and the blue ones are from the 180 degree rotation of the plate in the other direction. And then um, and you probably can't read the markings, but there's one in the center that's labeled with a, with a pi and pi was always the star of interest in the, in the observations that they were, uh, they were conducting. Um, there are, um, so this gets back to my kind of thoughts about the construction of the observatory and the arrangement of, of the observatory itself. Uh, there are literal physical reasons to do all of the work with these things in a single building. Your data has actual weight to it, right? One of these plates is, is moderately heavy. A whole night's observations is very heavy and an observing season is, is you know, 100 pounds, right? Um, there are 35,000 of these things uh, just down the hall from me right now uh, in a climate controlled room in, in numbered paper sleeves and as part of the parallax series and another 15,000 or so that are not part of the parallax series. There's about 50,000 glass plates down the hall from me um, that are cataloged. So if we look at the footprint of the building again, we can see the observing room where the telescope is a uh, record room where you keep the books that are the most important to access very quickly for what you're doing and your finder charts and all that sort of stuff. Um, but then in the downstairs, right next to where I'm, I'm sitting right now was the dark room. You process the plates in the same place. Um, and then you moved them uh, upstairs to these two rooms, which are labeled comp room, computation rooms. Um, well, We'll come back to those in just a minute. Look at that, we looked at that. Um, a little bit of serendipity happened very early in the lifetime of the observatory um, in, oops, I'm going out of order. That's okay, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, in 1925, there was a total solar eclipse that passed over Middletown in January of 1925. And uh, there's a, this beautiful photograph of downtown Middletown with the total solar eclipse in it on the left. And on the right, you can see uh, just members of the public gathered around the outside of the observatory to witness the eclipse. And they're all looking through smoked glass uh, at, to, to look at the eclipse which is not the safest way to do it, but it's the best they had in 1925, I think. Um, and so I love the picture of the child looking through the telescope. Um, and um, a, a number of, not just members of the public, but astronomers came to the observatory uh, to witness this event. And while we were doing our research, we found this lovely postcard. This was found by Horace Smith as well. Um, uh, who, who, with whom I wrote the paper about the 12 inch telescope. Um, this is a, a postcard of the observatory uh, that was made. But the real treasure was when we flip it over to the back, this is a postcard from Joel Stebbins, who's the person that invented the photoelectric photometer for making precise measurements of the brightnesses of stars, who came here to the observatory to witness this eclipse in 1925. Um, 
And it's written to Edward Burr Van Vleck, who's the son of John Monroe Van Vleck, who was a professor of mathematics who went on, went on to win the Field Prize in mathematics. And it's basically, hey, I'm at your dad's observatory watching this eclipse. Horace Smith found this because he likes to collect postcards of uh, observatories, old observatories. And he was just flipping through a rack of these things at a flea market. And it ended up being a photograph from one of the most famous astronomers of the 1920s to one of the most famous mathematicians of the 1920s. And it's remarkable. Um, anyway. Okay, sorry for jumping around through my slides. Um, so here are these two computing rooms on the original floor plans, the original blueprints of, of the observatory. Um, and here's a bunch of, of records of parallax observations from that era. So the computing rooms were for computing parallax through this complex set of calculations. And there were some aids in these calculations, like this calculator, which is uh, from, from 1897, but most of the calculations were done by hand and they were done by people whose job title was computer. And uh, they were all women uh, with secretarial training, which meant at that time in history, uh, a, a great fluency with mathematics. And it was their job to do all of the calculations uh, of parallax. Um, and all of the computers are listed in the publications of, of Parallax, but they are not co-authors on the papers the way that they ought to be uh, in kind of the modern way of doing things. Um, and so there's a lot of physical space in this new building that's devoted entirely to doing computation, uh, which I think is really interesting. Um, and it's not the first time, nor would it be the last time that large amounts of space within the building would be devoted to, to computation. Um, by kind of coincidence of history, there was another total eclipse visible from New England just a few years later in 1932. And they packed up most of the instruments of the observatory and brought them to Conway, New Hampshire, um, and set up in the town green uh, in, in Conway. And you can see all of the, the neighbor, uh, the, the kind of the natives, <laughs> the residents of Conway, New Hampshire, uh, Set, just set up chairs to watch the astronomers working because they'd never seen a spectacle kind of like this in their little town up, up in the White Mountains. And um, they were there for a couple of weeks. We have really good records of everything they did. And in, in this, uh, this is a book for the setup of one of the instruments that was taken by Bancroft Sitterly, who was one of the astronomers at the observatory here. And uh, he writes about the, the kind of the townsfolk and their uh, I think they would, some of them were just curious and some would like cat call and, and make jokes at them. And, um, and so they were there for a couple of weeks getting things all set up. And there's the, there's the eclipse. There's the weather during the eclipse. And you can see Frederick Slocum underneath this tarp and it's, uh, it rained for most of the time. They got a little bit of a glimpse of totality through cloud. Uh, and that was it. And I think all of us who have uh, been observational astronomers can appreciate when something exciting is going to happen and you get completely clouded out. But it's, um, as, as somebody who has spent some time as a, a ground-based observational astronomer and made uh, trips to uh, telescopes around the world to have my observing runs be clouded out, I can really appreciate what, what they must have felt like to spend two weeks setting up equipment only to miss their, miss their eclipse, but alas. Okay. Onward we go. So uh, in the 1950s, the observatory got another dome on its roof, and uh, the little eight-inch, uh, sorry, the little six-inch telescope was repurposed and put in that dome for student use again. And I think it's remarkable that this is this telescope from the 1830s that was again restored to use in the 1950s. Um, and I, I don't know that that's a thing that we would do today necessarily. For I guess we have. Um, to, to some extent, but um, okay. So what else is in, in this place? Well, at the, at the uh, western edge of the building is a transit room. 
And this is what it looked like when it was still a functioning transit room. Uh, you can see three different transit instruments uh, mounted on pedestals, brick pedestals. Um, the, the windows in the building, much like the rest of the building, are perfectly north-south aligned with these transcoms that could open above them. Um, and you have these lovely transit telescopes where it's just a telescope that can only move in altitude and not in any other direction um, and allows you to observe an object as it's transiting, as it's moving from the eastern sky into the western sky. Um, and that's it. Uh, so these are effectively timepieces. Right? Uh, you know exactly from, from catalogs the exact moment when uh, a star should transit. Um, and by measuring when that happens, you now know precisely what time it is. Um, and you can use this as a method for syncing clocks. And alternatively, if your clocks are very good, you can use this to look for anything weird going on. If the, if the time that a star transits is different than expected, then something weird is happening. And it turns out if they had conducted observations precisely enough and they had known what they were looking for with these transit instruments, they could have discovered exoplanets 70 years before they were discovered through transit timing variations. Uh, we still have all three of these telescopes in the observatory, uh, but not mounted on piers in these rooms. And that was the telescope in the 1960s uh, before it was retrofitted uh, with electrical uh, motors on all of the axes. It still has some of its old hand controls and the big ship steering wheel on the, on the pier. Um, time services were very important uh, in the observatory in its early history. Um, Time was broadcast to the entirety of Wesleyan's campus from the observatory for 40 years. So all of the clocks on campus were synced to a clock in the observatory, which is the one mounted on the back wall in this photograph. Um, and starting in the 1920s, they kept meticulous records of, of the clocks. We have these beautiful books of clock records in our, our library and all the clocks have names. And they would, uh, every single day, uh, they would sync all of the clocks and the, the notes are, you know, this clock that they named Molly was uh, 3.4 second, 3.41 seconds slow one day and then 1.0 seconds slow the next day. And, uh, and uh, so they would make little adjustments to their, either to their pendulum weights or, or whatever other mechanisms the various clocks uh, worked by. Uh, and starting in the 1920s, they were syncing the clocks to, uh, to, radio broadcasts, military radio time broadcasts. Um, and that was the, the primary means for syncing the clocks. And this was the time services room in the 1960s, where you can see uh, there's an antenna on top of the one cabinet on the right-hand side. This is now uh, Professor Meredith Hughes's office. Uh, tragically, doesn't have all the clocks in it anymore, but we still have some of them lurking around in the building. Um, and directly below that room is the dark room. And you can see this, this brick pedestal running through it. That was a pedestal for one of the clocks. Uh, in addition to the telescopes being vibrationally isolated from the building, the clocks were also vibrationally isolated from the rest of the building. So walking across the floor wouldn't disturb the pendulum weights on the clocks. Um, as we approach kind of the era of modern computation, uh, the way that the plates were measured, improved with time as well. And here you see one of the staff astronomers uh, with a, the plate measuring engine that we have in the basement of the observatory. Um, this was military surplus that uh, had been purchased. They were using it for uh, originally for you know, map me measuring positions on maps uh, phot and from photographs uh, from above. And it was repurposed for measuring positions of stars on astronomical plates. And uh, the, the modern invention that they attached to this was that once you had positioned your star on a plate, you could hit a foot pedal and it would punch the position onto a punch card with a key punch machine that was situated here. Um, and the first computer that Wesleyan owned was installed in the observatory. It was the joint property of the departments of astronomy, mathematics, and Russian which tells you something about the era in which this was taking place. Um, and, uh, and here's yet more of it with this uh, 
this woman whose job title has probably changed from computer to something else by this point in time, uh, punching in data from parallax tables uh, into a key punch machine and being fed onto punch cards that are then gonna be fed into this giant computer that occupies the other half of the room. This is in the basement of the observatory. Um, and the university was super excited by this and said, well, gosh, it seems like computing is really the future around here. What we really ought to do is make the whole observatory into space for computing. Um, and they drew up plans in the, 19, the, the late 1960s to do just this. Um, and so this is a, a schematic of, of the first floor of the observatory with the classroom now divided up into kind of cubicles, um, the main observatory office divided into cubicles, uh, the library repurposed as a, a multi-purpose function room. Um, and the only rooms the astronomers get to keep are the dome, the little record room, and the transit room. And everything else would be repurposed for, for computation, including the basement. And in the basement of the observatory, the only thing the astronomers get to keep is labeled in pink here, that's the dark room. Everything else would be taken over for computation. There's large, where, this is where the parallax plates are now. It would have been instead large racks uh, for, for holding punch cards and then magnetic tape. Thankfully, this did not happen. And a couple of years later, the observatory started building what's now actually Science Center uh, across the street. And uh, when they got the funding to build this new Science Center, that enabled them to build a computation center there and they didn't take over the observatory. But this makes the observatory at Wesleyan nearly unique. Um, there are no other small liberal arts college campuses that still have observatories with their astronomers still in them. Some of them still have functioning telescopes. Most of them don't. And none of them have their astronomers still in the building. A couple of the bigger schools do. Harvard still does. Yale sort of still does, uh, but none of the other liberal arts colleges do. And um, it's precisely because of this move to centralize everything like with the construction of the Science Center, uh, as science funding becomes insane in the country during the Cold War, um, astronomy departments are folded into physics. The observer classical observatories that have focuses on things like parallax or other practical problems in astronomy are, are closed. Um, and um, and fade away. Um, so it's really very fortunate and, and lucky in many ways um, that, that Wesleyan got to retain its observatory uh, through all of this with the astronomers still living in it. Um, okay. So in the 1970s, we added uh, another telescope, a 24 inch reflector um, that was donated uh, by, by Perkin of the Perkin Elmer Corporation. This was his personal telescope and it had been on his estate in New Canaan. And uh, upon his death, his, his family donated the telescope to Wesleyan and it's still there. It's still in pretty decent working condition. Uh, we're not really sure what its future is going to be yet. It's been quasi retired for the time being, but it will probably come out of retirement and serve some purpose, uh, but I'm not sure what yet. Okay, and just to kind of try to wrap things up quickly, here's the, the library of the observatory in the 1960s, thankfully not turned into a computation center. Here it is in the early 2000s uh, with all of the lower shelving uh, devoted to, to journals, du duplicate copies of journals. Um, and here it is today, literally this morning, I took this picture this morning. Um, where we've, we've turned the whole lower portion of the, the shelves into museum display cases to house many of our most prized possessions and try to tell a story of, of, that I've told you guys some of uh, today. And then simultaneously with that, of course, you all know that we, we cleaned up the old refractor a little bit. It was in pretty sad shape when I, when I first got the Wesleyan and we were not sure what we were going to do with it. And we did something nice with it. And, and this is what it looks like now. Um, and we will 
we really look forward to inviting you guys back, um, hopefully very, very soon uh, to use this telescope uh, again. I was just telling John at the beginning that I used it a week ago and it's still in perfect condition. Um, I, I opened up its little laptop, told it to use the alignment from the last time we used the telescope six months ago, pointed it at the moon and the moon was dead center in the telescope. So it's working perfectly. And finally, this is our, our newest addition uh, to the observatory um, in the little dome, and now not ho holding a 200 year old refracting telescope, but now has a, a brand new 24 inch uh, plane wave telescope uh, on an Altaz mount. Um, and uh, it is very nearly uh, fully automated um, in, its, in its operation. We're testing the Q-based operations now uh, we're installing a new weather station in the next week or so. Um, and once that happens, uh, the telescope will be able to observe uh, fully autonomously, deciding on if it's clear on its own, opening up, observing targets for us and, and closing down again uh, at, at the end of the night. Um, and I'm particularly excited uh, about this uh, because uh, the telescope is able to point to anywhere in the sky in only a few seconds. The limit to how fast it can move is how fast it takes the dome to rotate around to the position. Um, and so uh, what that means is we can do very rapid follow-up of, of transient events in the sky. Um, and so I'm really excited about the possibilities this will open up for, for our students to do exciting uh, research projects in the future. Okay. I think I took longer than I was supposed to, so I will I will wrap up now and, and just say thank you uh, for letting me talk to you a little bit about the, the history of this place. And I can't wait for, for you guys to be back here uh, using the place again. This is a photo of the, the Central Connecticut Amateur Astronomers meeting in the Van Vleck Observatory Library in the 1950s and uh, maybe 60s. I don't, I don't know the exact date of this photo. And, and we hope for, for this relationship with your organization to last for many, many years to come. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Roy. I don't have any questions at all in the chat, but you sure gave me a lot of smiles and a bunch of, oh, really? Uh, to some of those pictures, it makes me wonder where some of the stuff ended up. But I remember when the captain's wheel was returned too at the Centennial. Yes. That was something special indeed that somebody actually kept it. Yeah. It's it's under lock and key now in the in the archives. Right. I remember some horror stories too from like when the big console in the 20 inch had was literally rotted away and the bottom wheels fell off and you had to put bricks under them to move them in place and getting shocked at the dome connection to the wires and the yes uh, small dome because they weren't working properly and uh, that was exciting oh. stuff. Gave me a few gray hairs on the spot. Uh, is that a thank you or a question? That's a question. Uh, here, so here, it's to you. Yeah. What so the Fendium. Uh, we don't know. Yeah. So the, you know the the telescope was was modernized in the 1960s, and all of the the original uh, hand controls were removed and replaced with motorized systems, and they removed the pendulum clock at that time, and almost all of those pieces were thrown out. Um, we we. So I have no idea what happened to the clock. We don't have any of the hand controls. We only have the, the, the ship's wheel because someone literally removed it from, from the waste bin and saved it for 50 years before bringing it back to us. Um, that's the F ratio, it's a F 16 and a half. So it's a long focus uh, refractor, it's a beast. Kind of making as compensation from an 18 and a half to a 20 inch in the same space dome. <laughs> but uh, going back to the modernization era of the 60s, all that really meant is that you still had to engage a, a clutch, a clamp, the clutch, and would be would track in two axes. You still had to move the big scope by hand. And some of it just meant a couple of brass handles, and some of it meant a rope around the front. And so well, you know, they, they, they did install motors to drive it uh, on both axes, uh, but those, those were not working by the time I got to, I got to well, Wesley. I'm not sure when they ever worked. Go to. 
they were tracking motors, but not go to. No, there was a drive motor. You could have it would have been you know hand paddle operated oh. push to to drive it to coordinates. Oh, you yeah, would have had to did. look at the setting circles to drive to your coordinates still, but um, but there were drive motors on both axes installed, but they they did not work. I, I got here in 2007 remember. and they were dead then for sure. I'm not sure if they ever really worked well. They probably they were, didn't ever work well. The north, south, east, west buttons. Yeah, I think they only worked in one direction and for a while when I first started. And that was 22 years ago with your predecessor minus the, the P years, of course, but. I have a question, um, Roy. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, I know that you mentioned that the um, observing days, obviously, in this part of the country and everything aren't really too great. Um, what sort of um, like studies and programs does Wesleyan have at this point? Like, are there any really scientific astro astronomical projects that get done um, by the college students? Or is it kind of just um, up to the people that manage it to kind of... Uh, have fun with it and a little bit open to the public at times? Yeah, well, so mm -hmm. mo most of the science that our students do uses telescopes not on campus, of course, um, and that's um, that's the way it goes. But, uh, but there are a few projects that we're doing uh, on campus um, with, the, with the new telescope already. Um, one uh, thing that we were doing with the old 24 inch that we're continuing to do is uh, Professor Seth Redfield, um, is looking for uh, exoplanets that are transiting white dwarfs, right? The cores of dead cores of stars like the sun, they're about the size of the earth. And so uh, a transit of something the size of the earth or larger should really be an eclipse. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is about figuring out what happens to planets when stars like the sun die. Um, yeah. And that's super easy to do from, from our campus because it's like a fishing expedition. You don't know if you're gonna get anything um, and you just observe from a set of targets whenever they're visible. Um, and, um, and hopefully you'll find something. There are some known white dwarf planets now. Um, and so this is just about building up a census of them and understanding how planets survive as their, as their stars, uh, evolve and die. So that's one thing that, that we can do pretty easily. Um, and, um, something I was doing with the old 24 inch that I'm, I'm, just beginning to think about doing with the new one is um, is a study of large scale structure of tidal tails of interacting galaxies, um, which you can only do by observing a single galaxy for many hundreds of hours and then just stacking everything on top of each other. And so the best work that's being done now uh, in this field is by amateur astronomers because you don't need a big telescope. You just need lots and lots and lots of observing time. And mm -hmm. so if you're willing to devote six months or a year of observing time to one galaxy, uh, you, you can do that kind of thing. And so it's the perfect kind of thing to insert into a queue where nothing else exciting is happening. And the telescope <laughs> can just point at a galaxy for an hour or so and collect those data for a couple of years. And then we'll have a beautiful tidal map of a, of, of a galaxy. Um, and we can get all the way down to the sky brightness limit here, which is not great, but it's not terrible. Um, mm -hmm. We can do that pretty easily. But the thing that I'm the, the most excited about doing and that I have a, a student working on now uh, is with rapid response uh, of the telescope to, to <clears> things. <throat> and in, in particular, the class of objects that are interesting to me are, uh, are short gamma ray bursts. Um, because short gamma ray bursts are from uh, merging neutron stars. Mm -hmm. And these are things that we can now detect in gravitational waves. And so far, there's been one uh, gravitational wave event that was detected by, by the LIGO gravitational wave observatories that also was visible in, uh, in electromagnetic radiation. And so we could see it with, with telescopes. Um, and uh, it was bright. It would have been super easy to detect the, the afterglow of this thing uh, from, from our telescope here in uh, 30 second exposure or so. Um, so um, our, we're working on tying the telescope into the gamma ray burst alert network. And over the summer, we'll be testing follow up on short gamma ray bursts. And if any of those happen to be gravitational wave sources, we might be the only people to catch the initial optical afterglow of those things. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm very interested in because you don't need a big telescope to do it. You just need very, very fast follow up and to be the lucky one to to be the first to catch it. Um, so 
So there's oh. quite a bit that can be done. One of the projects I remember being done at Wesleyan was by a student with you know support from um, Professor Herbst. It was called KH15D. It was oh, yeah. even announced on uh, NPR as a discovery from Wesleyan. And uh, Bill described it as a project that kept giving and giving. It earned him Hubble time. It earned him time on the Keck observatories. And then it turned into be a tertiary. And 10 years later, they had more follow-up they were doing on this newly forming area. But has that one come back to- we're still uh, doing it. Still working on it? Still, we're still observing KH15D. It's still in the queue. Yeah. And yeah. it'll and be- a... it Being done locally or- Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No, from here. Whenever uh, once once we're in full Q observation mode, every night the KH15D is visible. We're gonna take some observations of it, and so that that light curve will continue to grow. It's now thirty five right. years, forty right. years of light curve, and we'll just keep going with it. So we're monitoring. There's a couple of other sources we're gonna continue to monitor that we have long term uh, data on, and we're gonna add a few more. Actually, we can because the telescope is so efficient. Um, we're, we're adding uh, a couple of, of uh, low mass uh, low mass AGNs that that Ed Moran is uh, interested in studying long term, and we're popping those in the queue as well because might as well. There's still a bunch of work still being done here at Wesleyan now to be. Yeah, so we'll have at least four science projects happening simultaneously on the new telescope plus whatever whatever new things our students manage to come up with that they might be interested in. I mean, the, the real key is rapid, rapid observation. And so if we have a student who's like super interested in supernova uh, or supernovae, that's, you get them for free practically. Once you're tied into the alert networks, you can just have the telescope do it. Yeah, that scope is very, very fast to respond. Yeah, it's like, amazing. Even the old 16 took a long time to set up versus the 20 or even the 24, but yeah. very insistent. Any other questions out there? I don't have anything in the chat. I don't see anybody with a hand raised yet. No. All right. Last chance. Anyone? Roy, thank you for taking the time. I, oh, sure. This even brought a bunch of new things to my eye. I made notes of things I hadn't heard before. Yeah, it's my my pleasure as always to talk to you guys, and uh, I will be talking with with John for sure, and, and Chris hopefully also about when yep. we're going to start doing some observing again. Uh, I think I think we're ready, so yeah, <laughs> I think we should we yeah, should start. We're definitely ready. I just fielded a request today from a Boy Scouts that uh, wanted to do it again, you know, do it from being put off before the pandemic, and I said sometime soon. Mm. Yeah, but not today. Yeah. All right. All right, Roy. Thank, thank you. you. Sure. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Yep.